We're standing in front of the 70 meter dish, DSS 43 here. Now, why is this thing so big? Why is it as big as it is? Why can't you make it smaller? With spacecraft at such enormous distances, the signals we're getting back are, are tiny. They okay. literally are whispers. From the Voyager 2 spacecraft right now, it's about 4.5 times 10 to the minus 24th kilowatts. It's, okay. it's a whisper. It's billions of times weaker than the power generated by a tiny watch battery. Okay. So we need such a large aperture to receive maximum signal. So think of this, the spacecraft is transmitting to us at about 19 watts. Yep. That's 19 billion kilometers away. It's less than the power it takes to run the light bulb in your refrigerator. So imagine trying to see that fridge light from 19 billion kilometers away. But by the time that signal travels all the way back to Earth, and it takes over 20 hours to reach us, that signal has spread out, become so thin, the signal footprint is now larger than the Earth's orbit around the Sun. Yes. So of that 19 watts, our 70 meter dish is only picking up a tiny fraction. So those tiny, tiny signals, the bigger the aperture you've got, the more detail, the more signal you can actually pull in. So it's just like if I was whispering to you right now, yep. you might want to cup your hand to your ear, making a larger receiving area to get that sound wave. We need a larger ear to be able to pick up that tiny radio wave. So it's really all about maximizing the size to pick up the quietness essentially of that signal, the weakness of that signal. Yeah, exactly. The larger aperture you have, then the more you can actually pull in. Now we're also looking and looking is the correct term here because we actually are looking in radio waves, right? In radio waves so right now. So just the same way as you might use a mobile device. So you can talk to friends or text to them or play Fortnite. That's just all radio waves going back and forth. We're doing all of our communication just via those radio waves. Comes in from the spacecraft, comes in off the reflector surface. That then reflects it to the subreflector, that secondary dish we can see up the top there. Yeah. And then focuses the signal down in through the center of the antenna, that receiver and, cone, that structure yeah. you can see there. And just to give you a nice sense of scale here on the antenna again, that cone structure yeah. is about the height of a five-story building. So, so that little thing there is... Yeah, five stories. Yeah, okay, high. So, all right. Yeah. Five-story high building sitting inside a sports stadium-sized dish. That's pretty amazing in itself. <laughs> yeah, it kind of is. And, and you're still moving and pointing. And moving thing. at the same time as, the, of course, the Earth's rotation and our orbit around the sun and even the spacecraft's moving. Tiny movement relative to our view, our yep. looking here on Earth. So that large aperture, radio signal coming in all off the surface of that dish, getting concentrated into those receivers. And that's where the work actually gets done. The waveguides that take that signal in and turn the radio wave back into data. Ah, okay, so, so that's kind of the brains of the operation of this dish, well, essentially. Yeah, it's the ear hole the in ear a way. Hole, the yes. brains then become all the processing. Ah, and okay. we have a whole building that's just dedicated to processing that data, and not only from Voyager, but all the other missions we're involved in. Now, obviously, people will think, you're during the daytime. How are you actually using a telescope? But this is the power of radio waves, right? Yeah, that's the beauty. Nothing stops the radio waves. So we can operate 24-7, daylight, nighttime, heavy cloud, fog, rain, those radio waves will keep traveling no matter what. And we can operate 24 seven, we can build big dishes to hear very small frequencies, very small signals from very distant spacecraft. Uh, and, and so this is all controlled here, is that the idea? Yeah, so we have our main control center team there that's operating 24 seven, making sure all these antennas are pointing where they're supposed to be pointing, the data is flowing back and forth, the command's going out, the information coming back again. Excellent. So I'm here with Glenn at the Canberra Deep Space Communication Complex. Now, we were just talking about this big DSS 43 70 meter dish, but there's lots of dishes here, right? This isn't the only one. So apart from the 70 meter antenna, we have three 34 meter antennas on site. And the benefit of having multiple antennas working in lots of different frequency ranges and with different spacecraft in different directions is you can communicate with any of those spacecraft in any direction of the sky. And say if the 70 meter was out of action and we needed to talk to Voyager 2, say, yep. we could use two 34 meter antennas connecting them together electronically to simulate a much larger dish. And that's, and that's because as we were just discussing the the beam or the footprint of these signals from it is bigger and sometimes than the earth or even as you said the earth around the sun so that little gap between those two dishes is pretty much minuscule it's not effective yeah so you use that wonderful technique they also use an optical astronomy yep. and that's interferometry using multiple apertures to be able to pick up more of that signal and we can work as i said across a wide range of different frequencies as well yeah. so we're working with everything from about 2470 megahertz okay. up to 32.3 gigahertz 
So quite a range of frequencies, not the entire spectrum, but bands within that, that different spacecraft operate at. And so, so the bands that you operate in, this is determined by what is built on the spacecraft, I assume? Yeah, absolutely. So some of that just comes into the economy that the mission wants to build into itself. Yep. So it might be only operating in the sort of megahertz range, some in the low gigahertz range. Some of the more contemporary missions that are now far more complex, wanting to get back more data, will yep. move into much higher frequencies, into the sort of tens of gigahertz range and that means we can pull more data back from those spacecraft. And so that really determines essentially what receiver you would use and the frequency you're operating on the dish depending on what you're listening to and kind of why you're listening to it almost. Yeah and exactly so for a big 70 meter dish like this it can operate in four different bands in okay. X band, S band, K band and L band yep. and L band particularly for radio astronomy. Yep. And so by doing that, it could say, hey, we're going to go look at this object in K-band, but now we're going to go look at another spacecraft on Mars in uh, S-band, for yeah, instance. Yeah, so it yeah. provides all that flexibility yep. in the system to be able to communicate with multiple spacecraft, multiple missions out there. Now, um, can you operate at multiple frequencies at once on the same you can. Yeah, you can operate in those different frequency ranges as long as there's not too much overlap because okay. that creates more interference. Yep. But a lot of spacecraft, say if we're dealing with missions at the moon, then that's quite typical. They're operating at both S and X bands. Uh, okay. One for uplink, one for downlink. Okay, so you can kind of do both at the same at the time. time. And so is it? So you said that sometimes you're downlinking and uplinking as we, we've discussed earlier. So is it constantly uplinking and downlinking or is there periods where it can only upload information to the spacecraft and periods we can only download? So again, that depends on the spacecraft okay. and how far away it is. Okay. So say something like Voyager 2 that yep. we're communicating with now, then that signal is taking over 20 hours to reach the spacecraft. So we could be uplinking and downlinking simultaneously because the signals are passing each other. And this out is because there it's just space. so far away, it's going to take 20 hours for the signal to reach the receiver on Voyager yeah, 2. Effectively. Or if you've got a closed spacecraft that's only a few light seconds or a few light minutes away, yep. then yeah, it's sort of uplink and there's a straight downlink or it might be sort of uplink. It goes off and does what it needs to do, say a mission on Mars, yep. and then you wait a few hours and then you do the downlink. Okay. So it really, again, depends on what the spacecraft is, where it is, and what it's doing. Yeah, I mean, it is like literally scheduling your different, you know, flights on a, at an airport. You know, they're coming and going all the time, or they're taxiing, doing other yep. things in between. And then your assets, your antennas in this case, can go off and do something else. So we don't have to wait for that full 20 hours for the signal to get to Voyager. <laughs> so you're not sitting there wait, anxiously waiting for the phone call. <laughs> we can wait, we can go off and do something else in between. Excellent.